This Choir Cast podcast is brought to you by the I Was a Teenage Fundamentalist podcast. Hey, Brian, do you know anyone that was once a teenage fundamentalist? Oh, Troy, you know that I was because you and I have a podcast called I Was a Teenage Fundamentalist. Ooh, Brian, I sense the Lord at work here. Mm, he works in mysterious ways. So tune in to I Was a Teenage Fundamentalist, the official podcast for the Azusa Street Revival. <laughs> um, I'm not quite sure that's true, but it is available wherever you get your podcasts. It's time for another round of Snarky Faith with your host, Stuart Deloney. This is a space where we irreverently wrestle through life, culture and spirituality, all with our heads in the clouds, our tongues in our cheeks, our hearts in our sleeves and our feet on the ground. At Snarky Face, the questions or even the answers are never the point. It's all about the conversation. So here's your host, Stuart Deloney. Welcome back to Snarky Faith. I'm Stuart Deloney, your guide through the wilderness of spiritually disenfranchised radio. Had enough of the insanity in Christianity? Well, you've come to the right place. We're here on a quest for a sane, grounded faith that aims to make the world better in real, tangible ways. We're not afraid to call out the religious BS or to look for better pathways forward. If your conversations about faith require a heavy dose of... Sarcasm. And even a bit of this... Then welcome home. You can find this and all past episodes at snarkyfaith.com or wherever else you listen to podcasts. We're here, we're there, we're practically everywhere. Just look for Snarky Faith. Previously on Snarky Faith. Many people believe one of these three lies about hell. Lie number one, hell's not real. Lie number two, hell's going to be a great big party. And lie number three, hell is a temporary holding place. The 100% truth is that hell is real and it is not temporary. It is permanent. And anyone who rejects God's free gift of salvation will go there. If you want to receive God's free gift of salvation today, hit follow or subscribe right now. Watch the video that I pinned below. Oh, that is really how salvation does work. You really need to follow, subscribe, in order to be able to experience the fullness of salvation. I don't know too much about hell. I don't even think it's real. But you know what would be like hell on earth? Project 2025. If you don't know what I'm talking about, Google it. You should, and it is terrifying. Welcome to the show. What a good way to start. Welcome to Snarky Faith. I'm Stuart Lone, your host. And this week we are going to be talking with Corey Nathan. Uh, Corey Nathan of the podcast Talkin' politics and religion without killing each other. So Corey is going to sit us down and tell us how to be able to have dialogue that is enriching and not nasty. Now, I also understand that in our show, as we begin, uh, we get a little nasty. We get... <laughs> We're probably doing a lot of the things that Corey is going to tell us on our show not to do. So... In the spirit of that, why spoil what I've already begun? And let's kind of summarize where we've been over the past couple of weeks, because there's a lot to unpack here. There's a lot to talk about. And there's really something I want to focus on that a lot of folks missed because everything has been happening so fast in politics in America. And you don't really mention politics without religion, because in America, it's a uh, certain part, it's all the same. But think of this, think of this. In like the span of like two or three weeks, we had the Orange Messiah almost got squeezed with an assassination attempt. Then we had Biden drop out of the race. Then we had Kamala hop in the race. Then we discovered that J.D. Vance has a weird obsession with couches and dolphins. I'm not going to spend time here talking about it, but it's a really fun rabbit trail to go down if you want to on the internet. Yeah, J.D. Vance couches. It's fun. Trust me. But what I wanted to kind of plant myself in our conversation piece to begin the show, I wanted to talk about how Christians have responded to the assassination attempt on their orange messiah. Now, I'm not condoning violence. I'm not making fun of it going on. I'm making fun of how they, how they have framed this assassination attempt. So how about this? Let's go ahead and hop into 
The choicest cuts of Christian nuts. That's right. It's the Christian crazy. If loving the Lord is wrong, I don't want to be right. Lord have mercy. The Lord is my shepherd. He know what I want. <laughs> So first up in the Christian Crazies version of Bad Takes on the Orange Messiah's assassination, we have Kenneth Copeland. And this should be surprising to all of you because you're like, what? Kenneth Copeland, he's such a stable guy. He's not a really cheesy, gross grifter. Wait, actually, he is. No, never mind. You're right. You're right. He is the guy that tried to blow COVID. Uh, yeah, the guy that was like, let's blow COVID in Jesus' name. I mean, in all honesty, I would only give COVID a handy in Jesus' name. But, you know, I'm not a prophet like Kenneth Copeland. So let's hear, let's just dive into this. This is, like, the, one of the most sycophanty things you'll listen to uh, this week until we get to the next bit of the Christian crazy. But this is Kenneth Copeland talking about Trump's ear. Here you go. We're going to pray right now over President Trump's ear. Yes. And the others as well. So let's start with him. Put your hand over your ear. Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray over Mr. Trump right now. And we thank you for an accelerated healing process. Lord, I thank you that Jesus healed an ear. Well, he can do it right now with President Trump. And there'll not be one sign, not one thing, Lord, that will even tell that he was shot at. We thank you, Lord, for the deliverance, his deliverance right now in the name of Jesus. Father, we pray over others who were wounded and thank you for the miraculous move of God, the healing power of God upon them, working within them. Be healed, be whole, be delivered now. Be whole and be delivered now. Yes, but again, the, a dude died. Like, a, a guy died. But we're really concerned. We're really concerned about Trump's ear. We really, really, really want it to be healed so no one can ever see the toppy tippy of his ear and go, oh, no, something happened. Your beauty has somehow gone down because of that ear. You know, because he's a gorgeous man. He's a gorgeous, gorgeous man. Mm. But <laughs> what, what a bizarre, narrow focus to be fixated on this. Not on, like, violence in America. No, no, no. No, no, we don't want to talk about that. We don't want to pray about that. We want to pray about the one guy that didn't get critically injured, ignoring the others, and just really praying in the most vain way. But I guess if you're going to pray for Trump in their mindset, I mean, he is a, a vain son of a bitch, so I guess... I guess that's the kind of prayer that jibes well with Trumpy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just so weird, and it's so sick, but it's so, so, so Kenneth Copeland and his church. Those folks are just a bunch of weirdos. And not to be outdone in, like, the weirdo sphere, we've also got Jack Hibbs. Jack Hibbs is going to tell us how we should really, really look at this, at this injury and in Trump's ear and what it says about God. Enjoy. Mr. President... If you're watching this right now, your right ear was bloodied. It wasn't your eye that got shot. It wasn't your nose that got shot. It wasn't your temple that was intended to be shot. Your ear was hit. But we would like and pledge and pray that you might bow your knee before the Lord Almighty and say... Not only did God do this, because I know, Mr. President, you said that today, that God protected me. But who is God, Mr. President? Who is he? What's his name? You've heard it for years. It's time to bow the knee. Amen. It's time to say that Jesus Christ is Lord, that he's the one that rules over the affairs of men. He loves and died on the cross and rose again from the grave. It is Jesus Christ, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And he desires that all men... Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. I couldn't take much more of that. But you know that you're a toady, especially like a pastor toady, when you're preaching a sermon and speaking out, President Trump, if you're watching me right now, if you're watching me right now, yeah, I'm going to turn this, this one moment into a call for salvation. 
Oh, oh, what a what a good twist. Because, you know, any good pastor should be able to twist anything into, I mean, I think that's what we learned in seminary. Like, you need to twist anything into a salvation story or, or, or one of tithing or one of tithing. But guess what? Guess what? If that wasn't odd and weird enough for a Sunday sermon, let's go ahead and listen to a little more of Jack Hibbs talking about ear blood and what does it mean? Besides, ouch, my ear's cut. But see, that's me. I'm not a prophet. If I was a prophet and would have seen this, I would have said, oh no, this is a sign. But God said, all those who represent me in the priesthood, there's to be a sacrificial basin of blood. And I want the toe of the priest to be dipped in the blood, the big toe, the right toe, dipped in blood. I want the priest's thumb dipped in blood because his feet and his decision-making is covered in my blood. And then take the blood from the basin and put it on your right ear. Okay, so what Hibbs is trying to get at here, I, what I think he's quoting from is Leviticus, uh, I think it's Leviticus 8, Somewhere around 22 or 23 here. In 23, it says this, Moses slaughtered the ram and took some of its blood and put it on the lobe of Aaron's right ear, on the thumb of his right hand, and on the big toe of his right foot. So, and then I think they go and do forth to Aaron's sons, which is the idea that that's how they're somehow consecrating and establishing a priesthood. But I just love that idea because what are you inferring here, Mr. Hibbs? What are you inferring? Are you inferring that... Trump is like almost a priest, and now we all got to do is dip his toe somewhere in it. Oh, I don't want to look at his feet. Oof, that sounds kind of gross. I, that's oof. That's a mental image nobody wants, and I just put it in your head because I put it in my head and I said it out loud. And I'm sorry, I apologize for that. But no, this is crazy. This is crazy. What's been happening because you have all of these Christians trying to find scripture and trying to find some sort of representation uh, of, of how this could this moment could have been something divine, as opposed to just saying, oh, yeah, this is a guy that has stoked violence and continues to stoke violence and division, and this is a response from that kind of posturing. And I cannot tell you how many times that I saw just over social media folks also trying to point out this fact. Because <gasps> guess what? Listen to this. Listen to this. It's totally real. The gunshots rang out from the gunman at 6, 11 p.m. And if you look up Ephesians 6, 11, <gasps> oh, Jesus. Ephesians 6, 11 says, put on the armor of God so that you may be able to stand firm against the tactics of the devil. Wow. That's, that's, that is signed, sealed, delivered. That is prophecy. Oh my gosh. That is absolutely not how you read scripture. That's not how you read scripture. That's not, you're handling scripture in a way that is just really weird and bizarre. And you're kind of just forcing it into your own narrative, which is really, really, really bad exegesis. And if we want to go on really, really bad exegesis, then I will give you this one. Revelations 13, 3. And I saw one of his heads as if it were wounded to death, and his deathly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. Hmm. See, I can play that game too. I can play that game too, but I don't want to because it's idiotic. It is a, it's a moronic game, but you know, you play moron games, you get moron prizes. I think that's kind of how it works. But all of this going on, which, which is what you would hope that you would hear from pastors out there, would be trying to lower the temperature, trying to be able to bring us to a place uh, where we realize violence is bad and that others, the other across the aisle that we look at, it's kind of what Christ talked about in this idea of loving your neighbor. And I don't think they get it. They do not get it. And all of this just gets more and more terrifying because all of Trump's little MAGA toadies are following in line with that type of rhetoric. They're not looking to dial it down. They're looking to dial it up because they believe they have God on their side. And if God's on their side, they want to get Old Testament on some people. Well, if you don't believe me, you should listen to Mark Robinson. And Mark Robinson is, is an insane candidate in my state of North Carolina. He is running for governor. 
We've had Mark Robinson on the show before, in the Christian Crazy, of course. But this, this kind of rhetoric is where we get to very, very scary and dangerous places. See if you can pick it out. I'm pretty sure you can. I believe in you. You know, it was a time when we used to meet evil on the battlefield, and guess what we did to it? We killed it. We didn't quibble about it. We didn't argue about it. We didn't fight about it. We killed it. When the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, what did we do? We flew to Japan. And we killed the Japanese Army and Navy. We didn't even quibble about it. I didn't start this fight. You did. You wanted to be left alone. You should have left me alone. We didn't argue and capitulate and talk about, well, maybe we shouldn't fight the Nazis that hard. No, they're bad. Kill them. Some liberal somewhere is going to say that sounds awful. Too bad. That sounds awful. This kind of stuff is terrifying because, because really what, what Robinson is setting up a situation here in his kind of like straw man argument for this, in the past, we've had to kill people because of war, right? And I don't think anybody glorified the killing parts. I mean, unless you're like Quentin Tarantino, nobody really glorified the killing parts of World War II. We're not trying to say that was good. It was just what people did in order to stop the war. But this kind of rhetoric at this kind of time, especially from a person who has spoken out so hatefully against the LGBTQ community, continues to call people that are trans trash, and this kind of stuff, this kind of stuff to the followers, all they're going to hear is, well, it's almost like World War III with my neighbor, but I gotta kill him, you know, in Jesus' name. This kind of stuff is scary and it's sick. But Stuart, you may say, that guy is a politician. Now, he may, like to quote scripture, he may like to stand behind the Bible in a lot of different scenarios, but he's not a guy that's in a pulpit, even though he was actually giving that speech from a pulpit. But let's go ahead and listen to evangelist Chuck Harding. And Chuck is, you know, as any good evangelist, reaching out to people, uh, being compassionate for people. So, you know, we know Chucky here is going to have a very uh, nuanced and well-thought-out take on the situation that we're in. For entreat God, interceding in prayer. You see, truly, I believe the future belongs to us. It doesn't belong to the heathen. It belongs to God's people. You know, just like I do, what it says in 2 Corinthians 7, verse 14. If my people, God says, my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked way, then will I hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. The future belongs to us. It doesn't belong to the Sodomites. But if we don't pray, if we don't ask God for some miracles, see, I truly believe this. God is still the God of the miracle. He's performed miracles for us, individually, collectively, nationally, for as long as we have a history, we've seen that. No way we should have won the war for independence, but we did. You say, Brother Harney, I, I don't know if patriotism is a good thing. Some of the young fellas coming up think patriotism is wrong. Are you kidding me? Jesus Christ came to seek and to save that which was lost, but he also wept over his national capital. Oh, yes, got it. So Jesus wept over his national capital. Did, were any of these guys weeping um, on January the 6th when that whole insurrection was happening? No, th again, this is very dangerous speech. It's a very us versus them mentality. Did Jesus talk about everyone in terms of us and them? No, everyone is your neighbor. Well, I have an enemy. It doesn't matter. You're supposed to love your neighbor. And you're supposed to love your enemy. Yeah, but we need miracles. We need miracles. You know, a miracle would actually bring these hateful, bigoted folks, bringing them to the understanding that they have nothing to do with the teachings of Christ. That would be, that would be a glorious miracle. But I'm not putting much hope in that one. And that, that leads us directly to our Christian cringe. It is the worst. It is the absolute worst of the Christian crazy. So, and this will beautifully dovetail into things. You'll see, you'll see, it's going to come full circle in what we've been talking about this morning. So, let's go for it. Let's have your Christian cringe. Christian cringe. No, God, please, no, no. 
And again, Christians, get out and vote just this time. You won't have to do it anymore. Four more years, you know what? It'll be fixed, it'll be fine. You won't have to vote anymore, my beautiful Christians. I love you, Christians. I'm not Christian. I love you. Get out. You got to get out and vote. In four years, you don't have to vote again. We'll have it fixed so good, you're not going to have to vote. Oh, my Christians, my little Christians, my dear little minions. Oh, my little Christians. You heard it. You heard it from the Orange Messiah. Hey, Christians, if you get out and vote and get him in this time, don't worry about voting. Don't worry about voting ever again, because he's going to fix it all. He's totally going to fix it all. And you would assume something like this would have happened way, way, way before pew, pew, pew happened to him. But no, 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 no. This, this happened recently. Him telling folks, don't worry, you don't ever have to vote again. It's cringy, and it is scary as hell. And if you don't believe me, wait till you get to this next clip. Now, this is Texas State Representative James Tallarico. And I've, I, I, I love this guy. I have had his clips on here before. And it is his warning. But he is, he is expressing how to speak about the other side, even when they're very dangerous, but how to speak about it in very clear, concise terms. And again, it's a warning about Project 2025. If you don't know about it, you should Google it or, or go over to patheos.com and look up Snarky Faith because I have an article on, over there as well. But enough about me. Let's get to Texas State Representative James Tallarico. I know what's coming because I see it every day at the Texas Capitol. They are testing these ideas in states like Texas before they take them nationwide. Banning books, banning abortion, forcing every teacher to display the Ten Commandments, replacing school counselors with untrained chaplains, defunding public schools to subsidize private Christian schools. We are sleepwalking toward theocracy, and we must act with the urgency that this moment demands. So in the spirit of acting under the urgency that this moment demands, I did this interview with Corey Nathan uh, a couple months back, and it was a great interview. I love sitting down and talking with him. And Corey, Corey is all about being able to have sane conversations with people that don't believe like you. And even though I know I've just roasted folks for like the past, I don't know, 20 minutes, because that's what I do. I do think this is a very, very edifying conversation for us to have. And I think this is something that can be enlightening. And I think this is something that can help us to move forward in better ways, uh, to engage others differently, to be able to engage in politics differently, to engage in our faith differently. But this is a great conversation that we had, and I'm so glad that I had him on the show for, if we're going to use scripture out of context, for such a time as this. So without further ado, let's hop to the interview. With me today is Corey Nathan, host of the popular podcast, Talking Politics and Religion Without Killing Each Other. And that is precisely our aim today. Corey is here to shed some light on navigating those tricky conversations with folks who see the world differently. In a time where keeping things civil seems more challenging than ever, his insights, hopefully... <laughs> couldn't be more timely, especially in 2024. So welcome, Corey. Welcome to the show. Stuart, I have serious issues with you right out of the gate, man. <laughs> you said talking and killing. It's talking and killing, man. Come on, oh, get it straight. Dang it. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I did. I, I was, yes. Enunciation, enunciation. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Other than that, I'm doing great. But You're doing uh, great. Awesome. Awesome. So, Corey, <laughs> uh, yeah, to kick things off, and uh, let's kind of dive into uh, a little bit about your podcast and background, because I feel like the question about, you know, how you started your podcast and your background are a little intertwined. They are. Um, yeah. In your story. So how, how does one become a beacon of reason? in the tumultuous seas of political and religious discourse. You're giving way too much credit. <laughs> the beacon <laughs> of reason. Dude, I lose my shit like on the drop of a dime, you know? Um, but that's actually why I started the podcast. I started the project mm -hmm. is that I, I know in myself that I am not doing this thing well. 
And mm. broadly speaking, politics and religion, like in polite company, you're like, you're supposed to say, oh, let's not talk po- politics and religion. And I'm thinking, what the hell else are we going to talk about? Like politics and religion is how we live well among each other, or it's mm. our endeavor to try to live well among each other. And the debate is, well, how do you do that? And, and within that, if we're not even talking to each other well, talking <laughs> to each other well, um, uh, then, then I mean, we're, this is now, as, as, as um, John Haidt uh, expounds so well in a recent Atlantic piece uh, and in his upcoming book, we're, we're in our own version of a post-Babel era, right? Mm. We, we, we're, we're geo-sorting ourselves. We're, we're in these um, bespoke uh, realities where we don't get each other's news. Um, mm-hmm. We're to the point where, and I do it myself, like, I do get, say, Ben Shapiro. Ben Shapiro, I've heard him <laughs> on uh, shared interviews, like uh, Larry um, Larry Wilmore show. Great show, great interviewer, such an erudite dude, funny guy, comes from comedy and writing. Um, so Ben Shapiro is on there. I'm like, huh, they're actually having a very productive conversation. So I went on to Shapiro's Shapiro show, having a very productive conversation. But also, So I subscribe to Shapiro's show, and I see every single day, just by the title of the episode, I'm like, I'm just... I'm not going to listen to this. I'm not interested. But what am I doing? I am insulating myself, even if there's some uh, cringeworthy stuff from my perspective. Like, I don't need to see him blowing up Barbie. You know, I don't need to see him, you know, taking aim at a Bud Light can or making fun of Taylor Swift. Like, I don't know. It, to me, that's just culture war bullshit. Um, but, but I'm interested, even if I strongly disagree with some of his conclusions, I'm interested in, in, in somebody like that's argument. I've seen it on my show where I had uh, Lieutenant Colonel, uh, Ale- retired Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Vinman on recently and two different people from, interestingly, two extreme opposites of the political spectrum said, I didn't even tune into it. He, one dude said, well, he's a warmonger. The other dude said, well, he's I uh, I forgot the word he used, but he's a military guy. He broke the chain of command. So they didn't even bother tuning in. And so that's what that's what's happening. We're in our own version of a post Babel era because we're not even allowing ourselves to listen to somebody who might disagree with us, right? Mm. So I kind of uh, went on a rabbit trail, followed a rabbit trail here. But that's that's what's behind my personal story is uh, related to that. I grew up observantly Jewish, became a Christian when I was twenty nine. Um, so I had to have very challenging conversations. To st- like just strange conversations, hard conversations with my dad in particular, as well as other family members about why I thought Yeshua ben Yosef was Mashiach. Um, And then once I got to the church, uh, maybe this is, uh, I'm curious about your background as well, Stuart, but when I got to the church, I realized over the course of a couple of years that a lot of guys were much more committed to their political and social positions than they were to the Bible or Mm -hmm. They would call themselves Christians, and they probably still insist on that notion that their religion and their relationship with Christ was first. I would say, though, that if Jesus said something that was at odds with your a priori political positions, like, you know, God forbid you actually heard something from the Sermon on the Mount, you know, (laughs) that that dude sounds like a liberal Marxist, you know, whatever. Uh, We don't want anything to do with that. Well, it's Jesus. Oh, no, no, no. You know, Um, so I was having these challenged conversations, strange conversations in the church as well, but about politics, because it was at odds with what I was, I was very convicted by the theology, by the, the Devar Torahs that, that I heard this Jesus, uh, teaching. Um, so that's, that's my, and fast forward decade and a half later, I saw it happening all around me, um, Mm -hmm. and thought that more so than any particular issue, you know, foreign affairs, immigration, tax policy, we couldn't even talk to each other, let alone about each other in an ethical and integrative, uh, neighborly way. So I wanted to just put one little drop, one little drop into the cultural conversation to see if we can try to do this better. I love that because you're right. Being able to have constructive conversations instead of us just kind of yelling at each other or yelling past each other about all of these kind of topics, especially ones that matter, whether it's faith yeah. or politics. I mean, it, it just gets tiring, exhausting. And like what you'd mentioned, at some point, we just turn it off, yeah. uh, especially if it's something that we don't want to hear and we don't really like. Now, you do this on a regular basis. So you mentioned earlier, you talk to folks from 
very, very different perspectives. Now, how do you create space where people feel comfortable to be able to share their views and are even open to having constructive dialogue? It's a discipline, man. It's a, it, or but maybe a better word is it takes practice. Mm. It takes, um, sorry, I'm becoming the old Jew that my father is. So I got a lot of phlegm and I got stuff. So if you hear me make bodily noises, that just comes with the package. You know, as much as I believe in Jesus, I'm still a Jew. So forgive me if I make a little hech in the hoigazek. Um, <laughs> that's uh, Irish, actually, ancient. Uh, no, I'm <laughs> Aramaic. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so, it, it takes, to answer your question, it takes practice. Uh, mm. And I have certainly not perfected the art. And I'm not being falsely humble in saying that. I, I, I regularly, maybe not every day, maybe not even every week, but I regularly stumble because I just lose my shit sometimes. Um, mm -hmm. So I realized that I got to continue practicing. So what what is the practice? When you find yourself in a situation where there's somebody who disagrees with you on something you feel very strongly about, whether it's a, a religious conviction or a political position that you have, you hold very strongly. The practice is pause, <laughs> listen, listen some more, listen some more, you know, and be radically curious about that person's position. Mm. It's because our tendency, mine is, and, and a lot of folks I know, and what I see taking place online and at bars or at a Bible study um, or bi Bible studies at bars <laughs> um, is that we hear something and immediately we, we switch into contest mode. We switch into mm -hmm. what we, if we think we're debating or we think we're going to convince them and win the argument, win the contest. That's an impulse. That's a, I don't know, that's, that's a natural reaction to that, that we've learned in, in the way we engage with each other today. But the thing is, if we switch into that mode right away, number one, typically we haven't really understood not only the position that that person is ar articulating, but the person, the human being who's articulating it. So mm -hmm. what I want to know, somebody, if somebody says something completely off the wall, I want to know more about that person. I want to know more about what's behind what they're saying. A dude said to me, uh, not maybe a month ago, uh, he, he was, he's a, a strong Trump supporter. Now he pretended to be a DeSanta supporter, but he was Trump all the way. And, um, October 7th rolls around. And, uh, so I guess it was a little bit longer than that. Uh, October 7th rolls around Wednesday after October 7th. Uh, he hits me up. I consider him a buddy. And uh, I have family in Israel. So he hits me up. Hey, Cor, how you doing? Um, oh, thanks for reaching out, Darren. That's nice of you. Uh, yeah, so what's, hap what's happening in Israel? Uh, how do you feel about it now? I'm like, well, you know, I got cousins there, blah, blah, blah. Before I could even finish, he was already sending me more texts. Well, you know, don't mm -hmm. you wish, are, are you Trump swore yet or what? Like if Trump was in office, you know, this never would have happened. I'm like, First of all, so this is how awful I am. Like, first of all, fuck you. Um, second of all, go fuck yourself. Like, like seriously, like I is really so my family is in peril. I got eight, uh, nine of my cousins mm -hmm. who are between the ages of 18 and 30 in Israel who are all being called up to the IDF as we speak. Mm -hmm. One of my cousins, her nephew, uh, was missing. Uh, turns out he tragically he, he got killed on October 7th. Like that's mm -hmm. where I am. And now you're doing a white shoes touch white shoes Johnson touchdown dance, uh saying, Oh, how do you like Trump now? And you know, back off for a second. And first of all, forgive me if not if I'm not enthusiastic about the guy who goes out to dinner with anti-Semites. Forgive yeah. me if I'm not enthusiastic about the dude who bear hugs the the Jews will not replace us guys. Forgive me mm -hmm. if I'm not terribly enthusiastic about the guy that you want to bow down and worship right now. I'm, I'm worried about my cousins in Israel, but that's, yeah. that's the thing, man. Like, um, I, I had an impulse. Now I say all this because like, I have to confess that I have proclivities, but I also have limits. But if that's the yeah. exception to the rule, sorry, I, sorry, again, I, I, you ask good questions. So I'm going off the rails here, but like, that's the exception to the rule. More often than not, it's more about like, well, Biden hasn't really done anything. The economy is terrible. I can engage with that. So if I understand where the person is coming from, say I, you know, about the economy, um, mm -hmm. a buddy of mine 
said, no, 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 I don't think, I think Biden's terrible on the economy. And I had reason, I have plenty of reasons why, you know, just based on indicators, why I think the economy is doing pretty, pretty well, objectively. But my buddy's point was, I can't take my family out for a McDonald's dinner for less than 40 bucks. So for me, the economy is not doing great. Ah, okay. Now I know something. Now, now I can connect with him personally. I'm not going to try to bang him over the head with GDP growth, with the uh, the deceleration of inflation, with um, you know unemployment numbers, wage like th- that doesn't matter. It's my buddy Austin who can't take his family out to dinner. You know mm-hmm. that's how, or you know gas price. That's how it's hit him. So now I'm talking to my friend, a human being, mm-hmm. Austin, and we're connecting on a relational level not a transactional level, let alone a contentious level. So mm-hmm. those are some of the things that if I can press, there are some things that don't, don't get me started on Trump and Israel. Like, don't just, do, don't do that. You, you heard a couple of, you know, you just like swallowed a couple of three word talking points and now you're throwing them up at me as if they're weapons in your armory. I don't, I'm not ready to have that conversation. But if you want to talk to me about you, your family, your job, how it's affected you, now I know you and I can connect with you. And, and I can be persuaded. Like uh, on a particular policy issue, I'm not, I don't hold it that closely. A particular politician, I don't hold it that closely. We can get to that conversation. But if we don't have the connection of human beings um, mm-hmm. and, and the, rela- the relationship-based as, as opposed to the transactional-based, we can't get anywhere. Mm-hmm. So- Sorry, longer no, I, answer what to your I'm question. Is, no, I love it. No, what, <laughs> what I'm hearing too is what you're saying is being able to see, see from their perspective and also have empathy in those situations changes the conversation or can change the conversation. I'm not trying to say it because some people are just nuts. Um, yeah, yeah. And, so yeah. so what, what you're saying is my, my reaction to my buddy, the, the GFY, <laughs> it's not really the best way to engage. Um, so, some of my friends, my nickname is GFY. I'm a Jersey boy, so that's like, it's another way of saying I love you. You know, they call me GFY. <laughs> so, so you're saying that, you know, just having that impulsive like reaction and like punching them in the throat rhetorically, that's not, uh, that's not, that's not the best, the most effective means of engagement. <laughs> no, it's, it's fun sometimes, but we want that. But you're right. You're right. Like nothing beyond me feeling warm and fuzzy and like the asshole part of my heart, I guess. <laughs> that's yeah. the only thing that I'm going to get out of it. Yeah. Um, how how do you, because this is one thing that blows my mind, especially when you're dealing with people that do have like crazy conspiracy theory type MAGA ideas. I mean, well, I think this is back. This is a couple weeks back. There was a poll. Um, what do I have here? It was 18%, almost one in five Americans believe that Taylor Swift was part of a government psyop. And so, you know, in these kind of scenarios, like, what do you even do with this? Because it is just so insane and like nutter butter that I'm not even sure. How do you even have those kind of conversations? So a few things. One is um, going into a conversation like that with the right priorities and the right expectations, I think is really important. Mm. Um, If your expectation is that you're going to, you're going to, Dis- help this person dispense of all of their wrong notions in one conversation, True. you're setting yourself up for failure. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the, first of all, my priority, I try to remember that my priority is the relationship over the, the transactional nature of, of some of these conversations. So if I can nurture that relationship by 1%, it gives me 10% of an opportunity to persuade but here's the caveat is if I'm nurturing the relationship, it means that my disposition is such that I can be persuaded, right? Yeah, so, yeah. And, and if I am persuadable, it, it, is the, it is the fertile field, if you will, of dialogue, the fertile field of relationship that gives me that much more leverage to persuade. So mm. I want to enter into it with the right priorities, relationship over contest, winning a contest. Um, and with the right disposition of, I want to leave open the possibility that I can arrive at some point in the conversation and say, huh, I didn't think of it that way. You mm-hmm. know, I could see what you're saying. Now, now I understand it better. I didn't think of it that way. If that's my disposition in a conversation, it's like, I read this book a long time ago, uh, the Zen of sword making and the art of tea. It was, mm-hmm. it was during the summer of 2000 when I was reading all these books before I became a Christian. 
um, I was just looking for, I was looking for answers. I had fundamental existential questions. I was looking for answers. Anyway, I, so I was reading, I, I was very compelled by the work of C.S. Lewis, G.K. Chesterton. I was moving in the direction of um, F.W. Borum. I was moving in the direction of finally reading the New Testament and coming, eventually becoming a Christian. But I needed to explore or re-explore all of these other world religions and philosophies. One of the books was this, this book. I think his name, the author's name is Suzuki. So one of the images is uh, the master puts his sword in the river, and it's so perfectly made that a leaf floats by, and the leaf is cut by how perfect the sword is made. The, um, the student knows, or the, the master knows that his student has surpassed him when he puts his sword in the river and all leaves um, somehow go around. They don't even want to get into the fight, if you will. Um, mm. So uh, that's just one illustration of like, I'm not looking for the contest because I'm not going to win the contest. If you think, mm -hmm. oh, I scored the perfect rhetorical point, I win, who wins? You didn't convince anybody. And by the way, everybody who's watching, first of all, nobody's watching. Nobody's listening at a certain point. But if they are, all they think is you're an asshole, right? Mm -hmm. So um, that's my, my expectation and my disposition is if I can nurture the relationship and my expectation or my hope is that I can move one person by 1% in this one conversation, I think that's a good expectation. So if it's something concrete, like, um, I, listen, I am, if there is an issue, I'm a democracy zealot. Like, so I follow the 61 cases that the Trump campaign brought between mm -hmm. election day and January 6th of uh, 2020, 2021. Um, so I know that I know that like the back of my hand, I know, um, all of the arguments, some of which have zero merit. I like, I can't, I can't respond to Jewish space lasers controlled by dead dictators. Like that's not something that I can engage with you about. Um, you know, so one other thing I'll say about that is that they're also, Yuval Levin, a great um, conservative philosopher. He's with the American Enterprise Institute. He said, sometimes you just got to get to the point of saying, you know, with the Jewish space lasers or whatever, um, of saying, Uncle Al, I really strongly disagree with you. Now pass the gravy. <laughs> you know, you just got to be like, we're good. We're, we could talk about the Mets. We could talk about any number of other things. This is just not something we're going to be able to talk about. <laughs> so knowing I, your limitations is important too. <laughs> I love that. And so I, that, that leads me to something else too, that what are ways too that you found like your Uncle Al gravy boat situation? <laughs> uh, <laughs> what What are ways that you've also found to be able to get out of these kind of conversations? Because sometimes I feel like you can be in heated conversations with folks and then uh, at least for me, I've also noted like there's a time where I feel like we've jumped the shark and like nothing <laughs> constructive is happening if we continue down this road. What What have ways, yeah, what are ways you found to be able to find the so, exit door? Do you, do you want to get out of the conversation altogether or do you want to stay in conversation in general, but just not on those topics? Let's go both. Okay. Give me, give me, give me one of each. Yeah. So there've been plenty of times I have this buddy, Robert, he is just an earnest, loyal, good man. Um, he, he's just so admirable in so many ways, but sometimes, uh, with, with him, we've hit this, it's not even a dead end. It's like a dead end with a bunch of TNT at the end of it. Um, <laughs> and, and we just lose it. So there are some times when I just got to walk away from the conversation from that evening altogether. And it's like, we gotta, we gotta go to our corners for a little while. We can't talk about this and we'll mm -hmm. hang out. We'll have, we'll share some, he's a, he knows his whiskey, uh, as much crap as I give him about, he's, he's kind of militant about how one should drink whiskey, you know, but, uh, um, it, but, usually it's just the mouth, right? Or is there well, a different no. way? I mean, he's like, you I have know. to smell it a certain way and take a little bit, you know, and then put the drop and then try, you know, I'm like, I'm, I can drink whiskey. I, I, like, I don't need some lessons. On, but anyway, so we can have a fun conversation about whiskey and me give him crap about how militant he is. Um, but we can't talk about politics for a time, right? Mm -hmm. We can revisit it and, and enter with great caution. Um, so that's one instance with this dude, Darren, I, I told him, look, dude, I am not in a headspace or a heart space where we can talk about this. I am not like you are wrong and I can't count how many ways, but I am not the one who, who has the, 
who has the patience to walk you through it. This is not going to go well if we continue to talk about this. In fact, it's more likely to end our relationship uh, permanently than, than it is to produce any positive results from either side. So I needed to know my boundaries, frankly. Um, mm. You know, there, there is, so I, I need to pull the ripcord sometimes, but that's like the 1%. You know, more often than not, if it does go south, it's more like what I described with my buddy Robert, where I just have to like, I, I lost my shit. I did not, that was not the best of me. It's, I don't, I'm not going to judge you about it, but like, it's not bringing out the best in me. And then thus, it's not fair to you as my friend who I love. So I need to back away from this for a while. It, can we revisit at some point in the future? Yes. Um, but it's not. Now's not the time. Knowing that, knowing your limitations, knowing, becoming more aware of my own proclivities that, that I can then work on, that's an important factor. Um, the other exit is just like recognizing um, if you do want to exit from the conversation, uh, exercising self-control and restraint of like for me, I know that certain circumstances are not conducive for me to have productive conversations. Like I'm going to sound like an asshole saying this, but like some people like they're not in my league, <laughs> you know, I, I, I read a lot. I get, I have the privilege of talking to these incredible scholars, thinkers, leaders, elected, like, so sometimes if I'm sitting around a table of more than three people, including me, um, if there's four people at a table, it's typically not a place where constructive conversations like these are going to happen because mm. it just becomes everybody waiting for their chance to say the thing that they're thinking and not really listening. True. So that's just from the others are able to have that multi-person conversation, you know, and find it very uh, edifying. Uh, I just know for me, like if it's three people, I'm, I'm there one-on-one, -on -one, I'm, I'm typically pretty good. So just knowing one's limitations, and then sometimes just diverting the conversation. If it is a one-on-one -on -one conversation not, that's not going well and you recognize it's not going well, you know, there's other things to talk about. I personally love talking about politics and religion. That's primary for me because like of what I said before. But there's other things. There's family, occupation, recreation. You know, like there's plenty of other things to talk about. So we can, we can divert the conversation. Hey, man, how about the meds? How about the weather? What, what is it that you do again? Oh, did you get a raise? You got, or what? I don't know, whatever. There's plenty of other things to talk about that you can divert the conversation to. No, I, I love how you've kind of framed this into, this isn't even necessarily talking politics. What you're almost talking about is just how to be a decent human being and friend <laughs> in many ways. I mean, I mean, because if you think about it, like uh, uh, you'd mentioned your like evangelism conversion story. And I think too often we treat politics like we're having to evangelize the other side to get us to this place. And, and I think that whether it be religious evangelism or even political evangelism, when we lose sight of the other person that we're talking to, where they just yeah. become almost like a mark or just another like notch in our belt. Uh, <laughs> maybe that's no. not the right one here, but yeah, kind no, no, of no. like that. Yeah. You're, you're, you're onto something really important. So rewind back to 2000, the year 2000. And what I realized was the dude that was talking to the, to me the most about the possibility of becoming a Christian, mm -hmm. I saw it as proselytization. So mm -hmm. I recognized from the get go. And the first book that he recommended to me was more than carpenter, the Josh McDowell book. I recognized this um, tactic and the desired result. The tactic was I am going to pound you. Sorry. Um, I am going to pound no. you <laughs> over the head um, until or, or persuade you or use all of these convincing techniques so that you say a magic prayer so that you get to heaven. And I'm like, mm -hmm. all right, I've already read enough to know that that is kind of a capitalistic morphed weird version of what the Bible is actually saying. Mm -hmm. So we can stay in this conversation, but I'm going to go about it a very different way. I have existential mm -hmm. questions that I want answers to. And what seems to me, even though I hadn't read the New Testament yet until October of 2000, so I was doing all of this inquiry, but I'd read enough of the New Testament to say, it seems to me that Rabbi Jesus, the Jesus character in the translations I was reading, was in, he was inviting people into a redefined version of the people of Israel, a redefined version of the people of God. and inviting them into something to do a thing, like to be, to be a participant in what we Jews understand as tikkun olam, God's redemption project. That's what I understood. 
Not some like, hey, roll, the, here's four verses, a half a verse here, another verse here, yeah. and another half a verse here in Romans. And, oh, now you should know, you got to say the magic prayer, <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. So, so, so a lot of our engagement, we're caught in this, um, I don't know, it's a, I can't think of the right word for it, but it's like this contentiousness. We think that if we go about it in perfect, the perfect way, we have just the right strategy, just the right words, we'll win the contest, we'll win the game. And then bing, we get like, you know, we go, we get, we get to win the, whatever the prize, you know, and the prize mm-hmm. is that person's soul going to heaven. As I think, as I conceive of, you know, a Socratic uh, warped version of, of heaven, not necessarily a biblically based version of heaven. So just, erase all that. Like, I'm not even playing in that game. I'm not playing on Mm -hmm. that field because I don't think that's the right field to play because Mm -hmm. I don't think that that's what the Bible's saying. Um, you know, as, as well as our culture, our society, like, what are we doing here? Are we doing tikkun olam? Are we doing like healing the world of ills that are in the world? Or are we doing, um, zero sum game? You're the problem in the world and I'm going to bang you on the head so that, you know, I can have your pie. So Mm -hmm. just like backing up for a second and, and having more contextual understanding of what, what game is it that we're in and what, you know, what like philosophical existential questions, as well as epistemological questions, like I'm not necessarily, depending on the person I'm talking to, I'm not necessarily going to get into it in that erudite of a way, not that they're not capable of it, but like some people just aren't into it. Um, Mm -hmm. So Depending on the person, I, I want to get. I want to speak their language. I want to have. I want to. I want to. Um, I want to get as close to where they are as possible. Come to their house uh, uh, symbolically, um, and and have the conversation on their terms. But there are some terms that I'm like, yeah, let's let's redefine this. I, mm-hmm. I don't. Know, I don't think you understand exactly what it is you're inviting people into or trying to convince people of. So let's talk about that first, and then we have another, a whole bunch of other conversations to have. Mm. I love it. I love it. Because yeah, because again, it's, 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 it's us boiling it down from like angry mobs of thought process in, into individuals that we're actually engaging in one-on-one. Now, speaking about discourse and about time, do you, do you feel like we're getting worse at it <laughs> as like a society being able to have types of conversations that matter? And in a lot of ways, depth? Yeah. yes, but that, it's a very general question. So in a lot of ways, yes. Uh, and we see the evidence all around us. In other ways, though, I, I am encouraged uh, because mm-hmm. when I started this program, I wasn't aware of many, if any, other projects or organizations that were diag- uh, seeing this, some of the same problems that I was seeing and developing answers or remedies to these problems. Uh, but as I've gotten deeper into the work, I am now aware of literally hundreds of people, hundreds of organizations, Village Square, Braver Angels, or, or even even um, even media outlets that aren't necessarily dealing with it head on, but are providing answers to some of the specific problems. Like um, a lot of people complain about uh, mainstream media. You know, actually, I, I I'm not concerned about that. Like, if you're concerned about mainstream media, you're just, you're just not working hard enough. You're not looking in the right places. I look, I look at outlets like the bulwark. I look at outlets like uh, the dispatch, you know, for real conservatives like me, Berkey and a William F. Buckley and type conservatives. There are great outlets just like that. Politicology um, is a great outlet. Uh, Ron Cecil, I think does a great job of putting together roundtables to discuss democracy itself and where it's going. So I think that in some ways, yes, the, the large networks like Fox and MSNBC, um, e- but even, even Fox and MSNBC or big new, uh, you know, uh, uh, institutional newspapers, Washington Post and, and New York Times. Again, it's, if you're just like, oh, New York Times, I'm not going to read anything from New York Times. You know, Maggie Habram's a really good reporter. Washington yeah. Post, not going to read anything from there. Robert Koss is a really good reporter. And some of their commentary, um, you know, George Will is always worth the read, even if he pisses you off. Uh, he's so intellectually stimulative. Um, like I, there's so many writers and even the publications that get a bad rap, but you develop some discernment, look more, mm-hmm. read individual columnists or reporters, 
um, watch certain shows. Like I, I uh, on MSNBC, I enjoy Ori Melber's show. I think mm-hmm. the dude does good research. He approaches it from his background as an attorney. So he brings on other attorneys. I learn something. I'll also listen to advisory opinions that has David French and Sarah Isger, two uh, attorneys. I don't know. I think Sarah is a Federalist Society attorney. David probably came before that in his training, but they're both very conservative leaning attorneys. So I'll, I'll listen to folks with different dispositions. But the point is, to, to answer your question, in some ways, the dialogue has gotten worse and the, the media that we're consuming has gotten worse. But at the end of the day, one of my favorite expressions I've learned over the last month or so is that's a you problem, <laughs> you know, like, yeah, yeah. Um, so if, if you're, if you're concerned about where MSM has gone, just look harder because there are good reporters, good journalists, and it's upon you. It's your responsibility to educate yourself, to be more discerning, to get good erudite, well-informed, well-established, uh, opinions and reporting, um, so that you can then be a part of those better conversations. So that's. Mm. The, the answer, just like a good Jew, I would say, yes, however, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I got two or three it. opinions about any one, one position. <laughs> now, now, last question I got for you. When you look out on, this is going to be a big year one way or the other, uh, politically speaking, as we're what, talking what, what's about happening? this. What's happening? Is there something going? <laughs> uh, there's uh, a couple of local elections near me okay. that right. I'm really concerned about the comptroller yeah. in my community. Um, <laughs> no. <laughs> now, what when you look at this, because I know you, you talk to many different people. Now, this is kind of coming down to you. Well, we'll start with the bad first, because we'll hopefully land on hope. Uh, yeah. But uh, I'll say, what, what is scaring the hell out of you? And then what is giving you hope? Okay, so what's scaring me is that when I say that democracy itself is on the line, a majority of folks would think I'm being hyperbolic. Mm -hmm. It's not, it's not the, it's not the, it's not even the idea that democracy is actually on the line or our democratic Republic, as we know it, the American experiment, as we know it, that is scary. Um, Mm -hmm. But the way, the way that I'm trying to rein it in is I'm trying not to get too far ahead of myself because I do know having studied Mm -hmm. politics and elections, we are an eternity away from November um, in in terms of how, how elections go. So I'm trying not to get too carried away with this possibility. Um, What is scaring me, though, is there are not nearly enough folks who understand what's actually on the line. Mm. So uh, and or they think I'm being hyperbolic when I say that. So that's scary. What gives me hope is that uh, what kind of what I was saying before, and I I can expound on that if you like, but I I don't think that's what you were necessarily asking. Um, What's giving me hope is kind of what I was saying before, is that Mm. there is this metastasized disease in our culture, in our politics, in our democracy, but there are enough people and organizations who recognize it and are developing the antibodies to address this disease. So Mm. that, that and God, (laughs) you know, frankly, like I, I believe in God, I can't shake my belief in God. Um, I also can't shake my belief that I am, I am not God. <laughs> so those are my two most sure. irreducible beliefs. Sure. I, there is a God. I ain't God. Um, but I, I, God, like, here's the thing. God's not like sitting in heaven or his domain, which, you know, all of it's his domain, but like, God's not sitting there like biting his fingernails. Like, Oh, I wonder how this is going to turn out. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he's not worried yeah. about it. Um, it. It'll be okay. Not only that, like on a more uh, human level, like uh, on our plane, um, my family's been through this before, man, and we're still here. Yeah. You know, my people have yeah. been through much worse over the, you know, several thousand years. So we're still here. You know, the, the Babylonians, the Persians, the Romans, they weren't terribly good for us. They upended our way of life in all different parts of the world. Um, mm-hmm. Pre-diaspora, post-diaspora, we're still here, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, or my grandmother's generation, they lived in that part of what's now Ukraine. Uh, when by when she was there, it was still the Russian Empire, um, Cherniostrov, Ukraine. They lived in that part of the world for probably eight hundred to a thousand years, you know. Mm-hmm. And there were different waves, individual waves that threatened their way of life. They stayed there for you know the uh, for for several many hundreds of years. Um, you know, it wasn't until the confluence of the Tsar's army, the Bolsheviks, the the, the Cossacks, a confluence of movements 
that it just made it so that, well, there's only so many pogroms that we can go through before we just leave everything and go somewhere else. And yet they survived, even though they had to leave where they had been for that 800 to 1,000 years. They still, some of our, some of our people went to what became Israel 25 years later. Some of our people went to New York. Uh, the people who stayed there, some of them who stayed in Ukraine ended up, uh, a bunch of our other cousins got, um, ended up staying in the, what became the Soviet Union, came to in 81, 82. Um, some of our, tragically, some of our families stayed there uh, and moved a little further north to Poland and we lost them. We lost them in World War II. We lost them in the Holocaust. But the, uh, the remnant of us is still here, right? Mm-hmm. So my hope is not, God forbid, we should go through anything even Um, remotely resembling a Holocaust or any of the other atrocities that my people have gone through. I don't think it's kind of, it's going to be quite that bad. Um, But I do have hope that we'll be okay. We'll figure it out. I'll still Mm -hmm. be able to go get a tuna fish sandwich with my buddy who has some cockamamie idea about, you know, Jewish space lasers and, you know, dead dictators. So (laughs) that's my hope. (laughs) Thank you. No, that's, that was, I love that. I love that. That was great. Well, Corey, Nathan, I appreciate you so much for being on here and the podcast talking politics uh, (laughs) and religion without killing each other. We got it finally in the end. Uh, Corey, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. And see, that gives me hope that I could persuade one person by 1% in one conversation. We got it, baby. We can do this thing. (laughs) (laughs) Love it. Love it, Corey. Thank you. Well, that was fun, wasn't it? Much thanks to Corey Nathan. You guys need to check out his podcast. It is good. Just as good as he is, right? He's enjoyable. He's a great guy. I love spending time with Corey. But before I send you off, just a reminder to share the show. Subscribe and give Snarky Faith a review over on Apple Podcasts. It helps to get the word out to new listeners. And if you want to reach out to me directly, hit me up over at snarkyfaith.com. But thank you for being a part of this show week after week month after month, year after year. I appreciate you all in this crazy time that we find ourselves in. So remain hopeful, remain vigilant, and keep going. Keep doing the next right thing that you have in front of you. And as I release you out into the wild, wide world, I send you out with the holiest amount of grace, peace, and snark. I'm out of here. Peace be with you. This Choircast broadcast is brought to you by Mornings with Schleiermacher. Conservative devotionals are rule-oriented, they focus on a Bible verse a day, and they're often made of the opinions of a megachurch pastor. How is Mornings different? It's idea-oriented. It focuses on experiencing God every day and contains insight from the father of modern theology. Mornings is a progressive devotional made by progressives for progressives. Check out Mornings with Schleiermacher today.